I don't know who. I don't know if they can hear me. Brian, are you going to give me a go sign? Okay, we're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we, I think, are close to ready. I think we should maybe give it another couple minutes. We've still got a few people that uh, I would expect to show up. Um, okay. But, Hello. Howdy, howdy. Hello. Robinson, it has me to come in and stay in with you guys. All right. Great. Well, I had a seat where everyone's comfortable. We got sent online up there. So. I'm not even sure what it is. Was that? Yeah. Who? Who? Uh, who was there with us? My name is okay. Neil, Neil Thompson. I'm the uh, chairman of Valley County PNZ. Gotcha. There's Miss Send up there. Yeah, she's up there somewhere. I just got off work. That's why. No problem. We're just waiting for a couple more people to show up. Maybe just waiting for a couple more people to you guys are? log in. I'm not sure who. Yep, three here. Ryan's not going to make it. And Tom and. Liz? Yes, that's right. This is online. Hi, guys. Hello. Um, yeah, we've got. Two new city council members said that they would plan on attending. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're close enough. We can probably get started whenever. So, is this something I called order or who's calling? Yeah, people? it's technically a TNZ meeting, so start. All right. Um, this is a planning session, a work session for the commission and in county. I will call this meeting to order. Do we need to have any roll calls? Yeah, motion. Just make sure. Okay, um, Brian, if you want to do roll call. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Rock. Present. Uh, Commissioner Nemec. Here. Commissioner Moss. Here. Commissioner Lyons. Here. Uh, and Tom <laughs> and Ryan Kinzer are both currently absent. Uh, no, hey, this is Tom Milquist. I just I just rang in. Oh, Tom here. Okay. So is Diane or who's Diane will be me. running uh, the presentation? Chairman Lyons, I'm here. Is is Bill here? Yeah, Diane, I'm here. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for 
attending um, this afternoon. I am Diane Kushlan and Bill Pelkany was, we are going to be tag teaming today. I'm really happy to have him involved. Um, and uh, I think I know many of you, I've been um, consulting to the city for a couple of years now. And I worked in local government for close to 30 years, including um, some communities very, very similar to McCall in terms of being small and resort, very visitor focused. Um, and then I've been doing this training for the last 15 years around the state uh, with different Idaho communities as part of my consulting practice. And I looked on my calendar and it was almost a year ago to the day that we did this training last year. So I really um, compliment the study for, um, you know, realizing that this is sort of an ongoing um, training and learning process. We're all, I think every day, every meeting learn something new and it's good to do a refresher for those of you who've been around on the commission for a while, as well as if you're new to um, the commission and to the city processes, um, this is a good kind of orientation for you as well. Brian's, Brian's got the, is gonna keep the chat open. And um, if you have any uh, questions or comments along the way, please just enter those into the chat and he'll let us know. And then, and then we'll stop from time to time to see if you have any comments or questions um, about the material, because we're gonna, we'll be really be going to be covering quite a bit um, this afternoon. So let me just move ahead here. Um, I think we've covered the introductions. Bill, do you wanna say a few things about yourself in case anyone doesn't know who you are? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Bill Punkany. I'm an attorney here at White Peterson. We've been the city attorney's office uh, I don't know how for how many years I've been in practice for 12 years now and I've uh, been working for the city of McCall since day one um, and uh, probably for the last year or so maybe even more um, I've been covering mo oh, so um, I should be somewhat familiar although I've not ever attended one of your meetings in person um, someday that might happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so it'll help for all of us. <laughs> okay, so um, what we'd like to cover in the next um, hour and a half, um, our first bill is going to give you some very important information about the rules for quasi-judicial actions. Um, and then I'll pick up and talk about how to have successful meetings and how that can lead to good decisions. Then Bill will come back and talk about Robert's rules of order and how to make motions. And then we'll talk a little bit about what the authorities are granted to local governments in Idaho um, for undertaking planning. And then we'll just do a quick um, concluding uh, review about what your role is and what your relationship is to the other planning decision makers, um, mostly within the jurisdiction. And then there's, there's going to be a time at the very end that we can just throw it out and talk about anything um, that we didn't cover or if you need more details about it, anything we can get into that as well. So Bill just tell me when to advance the slides and I'll give it to you. Yeah sounds good why don't we go ahead and go to slide number three. Um, so yesterday when I was preparing uh, my portion of the presentation and uh, you know that's funny because wow. Diane was right on the ball. Uh, oh, probably 20 days ago, maybe even more, and uh, just really carrying the lion's share of this. And, and I, of course, prepared my share yesterday. Um, but I, you know, I put to, I, I really kind of enjoyed this because it was a refresher for me as well. And and I went out to lunch with my wife after I'd finished preparing, and she said, "Well, what are you presenting on?" And I said, "Well." Uh, it's uh, probably procedural best practices and procedural due process for quasi judicial functions of planning and zoning commissions. And she looked at me like with crossed eyes and she's like, what the hell does that even mean? And I said, well, okay. oh dear. Uh, it's riffs on the golden rule and and I th as I thought more about this, you know, it's about how if your rights were at stake, would you like to be treated and what would you want to be entitled to uh, and still be fair to maybe competing interests? And, and, and that's really what's what's at the at the core of, of a lot of what we're talking about here. 
And so um, I, I kind of wanted to start with a question for the group. And I would like you to imagine that you've been summoned to court and you know that your fundamental rights will be at stake. What qualities would you like the judge and jury to have? So anybody can pipe up. I can't. Brian, why don't you call on people if they raise their hand? I can't see really see, but what just what qualities would you like that judge or jury to have? Open mindedness. Open mindedness. OK, so uh, maybe maybe they no prejudice, right? Linda and Sasha both on the chat say unbiased. Unbiased. That's good. A firm grasp of the, a firm grasp of all the issues involved. Firm grasp of the facts and applicable law. I like that. What else? Anything that we can think of? Sasha says knowledgeable and ethical. Yeah, knowledgeable and ethical. So again, I think I'd relate that maybe to the facts and then also unbiased and un, but but maybe the ethical is they don't have a, a competing interest. So uh, you, you know, some some interest in the outcome of of your trial or of your of your tribunal. Um, I think that's probably a good one. Anything else that you can think of? Transparent, I see that. Uh, transparent with the process and the information. Yeah, so so look, I mean, that was obviously kind of a loaded question, um, and I think everybody can maybe see where I'm going with this, but, um, you know, look, when somebody makes an application uh, for land use uh, to the city, uh, really what we're talking about is, you know, their fundamental right to control their property. And the city is saying, well, that fundamental right is subject to competing interests of the community. Things like uh, things like we don't we want health, public health and safety, things like provision of uh, of basic uh, utilities, uh, things like um, preserving uh, health and safety. And so so when we when we balance those two sets of interests, the individual's interest in in doing what they want with their property, against what, what we'll call the police power of of the of the state and in this instance the city so the state has delegated certain powers to the city um, really what we're talking about is due process and so um, the fifth amendment of the united states constitution um, which has been applied to the the states through the 14th amendment of the Idaho Constitution, give individuals the right to due process. So when your when your fundamental rights are at stake and the right to control and do with what do with your property, what you will um, is one of your fu fundamental rights. Those rights can't be curtailed or taken away without first giving that individual basic due process. So basic process to be heard, basic process to to present evidence in their favor and the basic ability to to argue to the decision maker that uh, you know for for their in, in their interest and for their ends and for their goals. And so um, since zoning boards, planning and zoning commissions uh, apply general rules to specific individual property rights, such decisions are subject to due process constraints. So what we're talking about here is we must provide if we're going to decide as a planning and zoning commission. Um, let's give them some amount of due process and the courts have called that when you're engaging in that process uh, a quasi judicial action. Um, and so so it really you can all start. You can start this with a Supreme US Supreme Court case uh, called the Village of Euclid versus Am Amber Realty Company. And without getting into the the third week of property law class in law school details, basically what that case does is it reconciles the developers rights to do what they want with their property and the community's interest in growth that doesn't damage existing property owners, existing uses and reasonably accommodates longer term interests of people and businesses that live there. 
often a developer will want to you know buy low and sell high and maybe add value to the property but those those interests don't often align with the longer term interests of individuals and businesses that are going to be in the community for over the years and so uh, so what what euclid stands for is that Yes, cities can regulate what people will do with their property or can do with their property, but you must afford the impacted individual some process. And we're going to get into what what the requirements of that quasi judicial process are. But I, I just have here in my notes, um, you know, so so not everything you do is quasi judicial. So some of it is what's called. So they basically divide it into two camps. You've got your quasi judicial camp, which is where you're making an application of the law and determining somebody's rights. And then there's the legislative camp, which is where you're deciding what the rules are going to be. And that due procedural due process applies to the quasi judicial camp, but it doesn't apply to the legislative camp. So so for example, a list of quasi judicial uh, actions would be um, initial zoning uh, uh, designations after an annexation, uh, rezoning, conditional uh, rezones, applications for instances, applications for conditional use permit, planned unit developments, and other similar applications. So typically it's where somebody's applying to change the existing use. Things that are not subject to that procedural due process requirement are things like uh, comp plan amendments, uh, moratoriums. I'm not going to read them all, um, but design review and approval, building permits, uh, rezones of large areas, that sort of thing. So it's it's where you're deciding what the rules are, and so th those really don't implicate the due process rights. So, so um, if we can move to slide four, let's get into what a quasi judicial proceeding should look like and what that quasi judicial due process should be. But before I do that. Does anybody have any questions about about sort of the basic philosophical and constitutional underpinnings of, of why we have to provide due process to individuals, landowners who make application to your board? No, that's William. This is Neil Thompson. I'm chairman of the Valley County PNC, and I'm sitting in here on your process here to learn. And one thing we found out in our uh, is, is that we have to be very careful of not only state law, but you know the county law that's there in making these decisions. And that's where we have a great staff that keeps us on track because you can easily get personal opinion on what you think, but you got to stay on track with what the law allows you to do for these homeowners. Because that's pretty touchy feely when a homeowner steps in and wants something done. So it's uh, I just throwing that out there because we've we've run into that and it's uh, it keeps you on your toes. Yeah, no, I think that's a great comment and um, you know, certainly we mentioned what the qualities of of a, a good jurist would be and you have to imagine yourselves as as members of a PNZ commission as as essentially the judge. And so mm -hmm. what what process would you like to be applied and 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 what rules are you going to apply? And you know, the reality is what you're saying is, well, you need to know what the zoning regulations are. You need to know what the conditions for conditions are for a conditional use permit and you stick to that. And if you do that, you, you can meet a lot of, of of these goals. Somebody who's going to be unbiased. Well, look, you're just applying the facts to the law um, and you know whether or not I like the way your dog looks. <laughs> the matter it's do you meet the requirements of the code? So I think it's a very good comment. Um, any other questions for me before we move on? No, but Bill, one if comment not, is your um, your sound keeps cutting out every once in a while, not constantly, but you might want to switch your camera off to conserve bandwidth. OK. Bandwidth conserved. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, um, moving into this, and if it keeps to, if it keeps cutting out, or if I need to repeat, please let me know, and I'd, I'd be happy to do that. 
if we're going to have a quasi judicial procedure proceeding. Yes. Just cut out. Did it cut out? No, I said we'll do. Carry on, Bill. Oh, OK, thanks. Mary. <laughs> OK, so um, what does that due process look like? So we mentioned that we'd want a, a, a jurist that is unbiased. And and I think, you know, one of the things that we might, you know, we clearly have on this slide somebody that somebody that's unbiased, but but as part of that, you know, we wouldn't want them to have a conflict of interest. And so, you know, I'd like to put it out to the group here. What does it mean as a as a commissioner on the Planning and Zoning Commission to have a conflict of interest? Does anybody know? Oh, absolutely. It has to do with financial. It has to do with uh, like I had one the other day, the people on the property next to me were coming for the, the board. And because they were adjacent to my property, I had to step down and not have discussion because of that. And there's and I talked to one gentleman that was a fire marshal about an issue or he talked to me about it. Well, that kicked me out of being able to have that discussion. So there's, there's just little things like that that will kick you out about having a conflict of interest or having a contact with somebody that you really didn't mean to, but it uh, it makes you have to recuse yourself from that discussion. Even though you are impartial and disinterested. Yeah, no, I think those are really good comments, and I think what what I'd like to do is maybe bring um, a, a little bit, a little more focus to to what I think what you've said is is all good. Let's bring some focus to that. So, fortunately for us, Idaho Code sixty Idaho Code defines when you have a conflict of interest, and Idaho Code sixty seven sixty five zero six states that, and this is a part of the Local Land Use Planning Act, and it says um, that a decision maker shall not participate. Oh, no. <laughs> employer, business partner, business associate, or any person related by affinity or consanguinity within the second degree has an economic interest in the procedure or action. So Bill, you, Bill, you cut out. Could you just summarize that for everybody again? <laughs> yeah, uh, boy, our, our modern times are terrific, aren't they? Um, <laughs> yeah, so you, your business partner uh, or person who works for you um, or somebody who is related to you to the second degree cannot have an economic interest in the outcome. <coughs> Did that come through? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. OK. All right. Yeah, just interrupt me if, if it cl clips out again and uh, and I will uh, I'll back up. So um, if you if you determine that you do have an economic interest and now economic interest participate is defined, but economic interest is not. But, you know, I think it's easy enough to say, look, would you stand to gain of the outcome? And if that's the case, uh, then you should then you should do two things. Um, first, you should identify that you have a conflict of interest. And then second, you should recuse yourself from participation in that matter. It doesn't mean that you can't be counted for purposes of a quorum. It doesn't mean that you can't participate in other agenda items, but it does mean that for that one that gives rise to your conflict of interest, you cannot participate in that matter. And that and that includes things, you know, not just the vote, but that includes also the deliberation um, of, of evidence given. Now, what it doesn't include is, uh, for example, giving testimony. So, for example, if your neighbor is in on an application, although you may have uh, although you may have a conflict of interest, so you can't engage in a deliberation and you can't engage in the decision, you can give testimony uh, as as a as an interested party, as somebody who's interested uh, in the decision. Uh, but in the decision or the deliberation. So um, typically, uh, you know, unless you have a really good reason for that kind of participation, um, it, you know, my advice is to just steer well away from that sort of thing and, and stay away from the line. But if we have to get close to the line, it's a good idea to contact your board's uh, attorney. And so for so for 
Um, and, and we can talk about, you know, in advance, whether you have whether it's a good idea or not for you to participate or not participate in 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 the way that you've you've anticipated and and part of that the reason for that is because did we clip out again no okay it is because uh, a knowing violation of that requirement is is in fact a, is a misdemeanor so it's a crime um so you can get up to a year in jail and a thousand dollar fine and nobody wants that it's bad news bears um there are other less restrictive uh, sections of the code, um, but I focused on the most restrictive one because I think compliance with the most restrictive portion of the code is, is probably the best rule here. So um, are there any questions about conflicts of interest before I moved on to bias? I have one. Yeah. Say that you say that you have a situation where someone comes up to you and starts a dialogue on a decision that was is is forthcoming in the in the next meeting or or in the, in the near future, and and they give you information maybe more than they should or or, or their particular direction. Does does that constitute along the lines of conflict of interest, or d d does it go down to that level? Um, I'll answer your question in two ways. No, I don't believe it creates a conflict of interest unless it creates an economic interest for you. However, it does create an ex parte communication, which we'll talk about in just a moment, which which must be disclosed. So um, do you have a follow up on that or, do you, or, do you want, or can I move on? Move on. All right. So the second element, um, you know, we mentioned it, that we want someone to be unbiased. And you know what does it mean to be unbiased? And that, Lost but it you. means that you must be impartial or disinterested. Cut out again. Yeah. Okay. Am I back? Yes. Yep. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Boy, this is gee whiz. This is great. Hey, Bill. Um, yeah. You may want to disconnect and try to reconnect just to see if it helps. It seems yeah, sure. like your connection might not be great. I just love this technology stuff. You think you save that bandwidth, or isn't yeah. it? Uh? I suppose we could have them call in and be on the phone line. Okay. So I've disconnected and reconnected. We'll see if that works. Um, so we were at unbiased, uh, and it means that you must be impartial or disinterested. Um, and so you shouldn't. Where you? What you shouldn't do is. Um, you, this is where it gets down to what would you like a judge to be? So imagine you walk into that courtroom and the judge says to you, you, uh, you know, um, uh, Mr. Uh, or Ms. Nimick, um, I, I don't want to hear anything that you have to say. I've already made up my decision. You're guilty. <laughs> <laughs> So, so they're they're not being impartial. They're they're judging you upon your character. They're judging you on on things that are occurring outside of the proceeding, and and that's not being unbiased. It means that you've been prejudged. And so, um, the best practices uh, of that were are, there's two things. First, you want to avoid an actual or display of bias. So you may know it's a small community up there. I get it, um, and you may know the applicants that come before you. But you should avoid expressing any kind of opinion on any matter that ever may come before you. And in particular, if you know it's going to come before you as a commissioner, you should just avoid expressing any opinion on that outside of uh, outside of your open meetings. Um, and then the second is um, you should avoid expressing uh, your opinions before you hear the evidence. Um, and, and don't make opinions about a person or their character or their history. Uh, in the community, you should really limit your comments and you should limit your um, your statements to evidence and facts that are presented to you in an open meeting. So, so Bill, can I give them an example, a real life example uh, from my experience in Carmel, which is very similar to McCall, it was a small town. And we had a very, very friendly, uh, warm uh, chairperson of our Planning and Zoning Commission. And she knew just about everybody in town. 
And so when a townie came up to testify, she would say, well, hi, Joe, how are you? How's the family? And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then, then when yeah. somebody who's from the outside coming in to develop or um, not part of the community already, um, she was very formal with them because she didn't know them. And so it did give, and I had to really have a heart to heart with her because she didn't get it. She was just being nice and friendly. And I said, think about the, um, the, the impact that has on somebody you don't address the, somewhat, the same way. So it really did give people a feeling that there was a bias against people that weren't part of the community already. Um, so it could be little small like things like that that can make a difference. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a terrific example. Um, and so does anyone have uh, any questions or comments or war stories about when and how you have been unbiased <laughs> or questions about how to be unbiased? <laughs> well, one one thing we've noticed or I've noticed on our PNZ is that because you know so many people in a small community, they're going to come in with the agenda item that's there. And yeah, they, you might be personal friends with them. And you just have to be professional and look at the information as it's presented because it is a small community. You're going to know those people, a lot of them. And you're not going to get away from that. You've still got to do the job. And uh, it's something I had to get used to. And uh, I think it's just part of what we have to do to make good decisions. Yeah, and imagine imagine you walk into that Planning and Zoning Commission, you know, maybe as I would. I you know, I do spend a fair amount of time up in, in Valley County, but but I'm walking in, I don't know anybody, it's completely tabula rasa, completely blank slate. And and that's how you should approach every every matter. I'm I'm reminded of an irrigation district that I represent, and they're very rural. And uh, somebody wanted to make some improvements to their irrigation system. Uh, in conjunction with improvements to their property, and one of the one of the farmers that was on the board, I mean, he just starts tearing into this this poor kid about how his father and grandfather had mismanaged the irrigation facilities, and I just I put my hands in my face and just shook my head. I'm like, oh my gosh, you have to stop this. So, um, you know, you may have that history, but but let's let's try to keep that out. Um, allow them the right to an unbiased arbiter. Um, the next is on ex parte con contacts and communications. And we've already discussed this a little bit in the context of the question that came up, but uh, ex parte communication refers to communications regarding a substantive issue in a pending matter between an interested party and a decision maker outside of the presence of, of other interested parties. So in, in layman's terms or in, in real, real talk, it's just like uh, the commissioner said, you know, so and so sees me at the grocery store and says, hey, I've got a CUP pending before your commission. We'll see you on Thursday. Oh, and by the way, you know, what do you think about uh -huh. the design on it? And just uh -huh. you know, starts getting into it never happens, right? Um, you know, you, you what you should do and there's there's the best practice and what probably will happen. But what you should do is, you know, document down that you had that contact in that conversation. And then when it comes up before the board at the very start, um, your staff should ask you for ex parte disclosure of ex parte communications. And at that time you should say, well, I ran in. We lost you. To go, um, and here's what they said to me before I could stop them. Um, and, and, that, and what that does is it discloses, um, it discloses the evidence that you've received to your other decision makers and also to those who might be in opposition to the applicant. And so again, it preserves that element of due process and fairness. Um, so quasi judicial uh, in quasi judicial proceedings, then we can say that ex parte communications are they're not prohibited, but they must be disclosed um, so that other parties can have a meaningful opportunity to rebut any information provided. Um, like I said, you should keep a record of your ex parte communications. Um, one thing that that I did want to bring up is site visits. So often, um, often there's a, a desire um, to to go out, especially on things that are you know controversial or or high impact, to go out and take a look at the 
<laughs> and you should resist that urge. Um, if be, and, and the reason for that is because you're gathering facts that you will use to base your decision on outside of that procedural due process. And so instead, if a site visit is warranted as a group, you should notice it up. I mean, I you should notice it up and go out to the site and give an opportunity not only for the applicant to be there, but also for other interested parties. And in one case that I was involved in, uh, there was a, a site visit that occurred um, and uh, one or two of the commissioners went off the, uh, with the applicant and you know went, went away where they couldn't be heard and had a conversation uh, amongst themselves. And the argument was, well, it wasn't of anything of substance, but still the appearance of impropriety was there in the ex parte contact because other interested people who are maybe opposing the, the meat rendering plant next door uh, couldn't, they couldn't participate in that. Were being gathered and so um, we need to be really careful with site visits and, and typically so in, in my opinion I think site visits should be discouraged um, but I can understand a time and place where it might be appropriate. Are there any questions about ex parte communications and contacts or site visits? I mean, real quick I this is Commissioner Lyons. Many times I've had it where the property that comes in front of us I've either in the past sold been a part of this or not sold myself but been a part of a sale been on the property a number of different things on many of the properties um, i do try to disclose it but it's really prior typically prior to any application usually prior to that even ownership uh, i don't see really any issues with that other than the experience i've had with the property i try to you know let the commissioners know that I do know, you know, more details typically than most, just because I've had experience on the properties in the past. So I don't Larry, is that I, any issues with that. No, well, yeah, sure. There's plenty of issues, but I think you're handling it right. And I think, um, you, you know, the expectation cannot reasonably be that you not be members of your community anymore, right? Um, and so, sure, you're going to have those those contacts with applicants and with the properties because you live in this small place. Um, and I think that's fine. I think to the extent that that colors any decision you may make or even, you know, even that you can recall it, I think that you should you should disclose that. I think I think Commissioner Lyons, you're, you're doing exactly what you should be. OK, I would, thought that was probably right. Just want to confirm. Yeah. Perfect. OK, so uh, if there's no other questions, let's go to slide number five and I'm going to try to go just a little faster here because uh, uh, we've only got an hour and a half. Um, but isn't this so interesting? I just love it. I could I could just uh, it's my life. Um, so, um, all right, so uh, open meetings. Um, look, I'm not going to belabor this. Uh, it's important that we conduct uh, all quasi judicial proceedings in an open meeting, which means there must be a quorum present. There must be the appropriate notice given and the notice is going to be informed. Um, staff typically has a really good handle on that, but it's informed by the open meeting law. It's formed. It's informed by the local land use planning act and it's informed by the city ordinances. Um, and so, you know, it's really important as we'll discuss, you know, the basis for decisions on the record later on that you take notice that proper you, you take um, notice that proper meeting notice uh, was provided um, and that's a part of your findings of fact. And so as you're reviewing your findings of fact in preparation for a decision, you know that would be something that you want to make sure is in there is that proper notice was given. Um, again, all, uh, it's it's important that all noted all meeting materials and um, packet materials are provided to the applicant and to interested parties and to the public in general. Uh, that's typically in the age of the internet, not too difficult. Um, public, so uh, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, somebody should have, as part of their procedural due process rights, the ability to be heard, and so um, and the ability to to know that their rights are being adjudicated, and that that goes not only for the applicant but also for interested parties of the community. Um, as you all know, I mean, the community often likes to show up and oppose things 
um, or support them. But either way, they're entitled to notice and um, individuals who are entitled to a written notice is defined under the code. Um, but you know, generally the public is entitled to notice. Um, and and they should they're also entitled to a, an opportunity for all affected persons to to present and rebut evidence. And so typically your meetings should be con conducted or your your hearings should be conducted in the following order. First, there should be a staff presentation. So city staff understands land use, city staff understands the competing interests, and they should provide you with a presentation on uh, the merits of the application <coughs> and the applicable uh, code sections and, and any um, positions that the city is going to take uh, on the application. Then the developer uh, should provide or the applicant should provide uh, their position and provide their evidence. Um, afterward, you should allow for public testimony. Finally, there you should allow for a staff rebuttal and then typically you should allow for a developer or an applicant rebuttal. Um, often there's a desire to limit uh, comments to two minutes and uh, the Idaho Supreme Court has held that limiting comment to two minutes is not consistent with affording an individual a meaningful opportunity to be heard. <laughs> and you know that's really easy for a judge in Boise to say that when they don't have 50 of your neighbors with pitchforks and torches ready to give 10 minutes, 10 minutes each of, uh, of the, you know, of, of great testimony. And so um, what this means is we can ask the public and we can tell them, you know, hey, we'd like you to limit your comments to two minutes. Um, but the best advice is that that be sort of loosely enforced. So when somebody gets to two minutes, hey, remind them, you know, look, we've got a lot of people here. Can you please, you know, try to wrap up your comments, uh, make your points and and um, but uh, avoid the urge to gavel somebody off uh, off of the podium um, because, you know, really all interested parties are are entitled to 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 make their point. Most people are respectful of, of your time and, and the time of it, it once it's pointed out to them uh, of, of the commission. Um, so. Uh, uh, Bill, this is yes. Commissioner Lyons real quick. Um, as far as the process or the steps or the order of the, the meeting, I know, I don't know how many years prior to me being on the plan zoning and, and we've kind of talked about it and continue to to do it this way, but we have really the applicant present their proposal first and follow up with the staff report and then kind of, you know, the rest of the order is the same. And I just happen to see feel that, you know, that if the city goes first, it puts the applicant kind of in a defensive posture and trying to defend their position instead of present their position. Is this something we can choose to do or do we have to switch it over to have the city staff go first? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I just don't know if if the city of McCall has a code section on that. But um, you know, typically, I think um, the so in a in a court proceeding, uh, the plaintiff the plaintiff will typically go first, right? So in a civil proceeding, anyway, and so the plaintiff has to make their case. Um, typically, that's the way that works. I I really don't have a lot of heartburn uh, with with the applicant going first. Um, at all, um, often uh, in other in in other areas, I, I you know I put this order up as what I've seen the primary practice. Um, I'm aware that maybe it's done differently in McCall. I don't have a lot of heartburn about the order so long as everyone gets a chance to be heard. Okay. So I know, um, know Sarah. Do we have the staff report? Everybody has the paperwork in front of them. I mean, applicant and us on the audience and so our staff first thing i'll ask for is a staff report on whatever the agenda item is and she just reads out the same stuff there's no bias it's just she just reading it for everybody to understand and to hear it and then the next thing i do is i ask for the applicant to come forward and present his uh part on that and it's it works real well for us and that uh, I've never had anybody feel like they're it's already been decided before they get up there just because you know the staff was given a report to everybody 
even if the staff makes their recommendation, say, against the development? No, the staff doesn't do that. The staff does not, at least our staff, does not give a recommendation at all on anything. She just gives the facts of what she has by law, by code, in her report. And But she is totally unbiased. She can't say anything that has that I feel like she can't even go there. She just got to give just the, what the code says, what the law says on whatever the agenda item is, and then that's presented. And then he gets up or she gets up and presents whatever, you know, applicant part is. And that's, that's how we run our meetings. And it's, it's worked very well. I do know in our paperwork, so if we do have a section that does have the staff in there that says staff recommends yeah. approval. But I well, you know that's what we have in our. I got to so. agree with that. She does a, um, she does a, oh, I don't know what it's called now, um, where you do. Uh, know what you're saying too. Um, <laughs> can't, I can't think of it. This gone blank. Con con uh, Not facts and conclusions. It's, it's, it's a chart that she takes of all the parts and pieces of it and does a positive. Oh, the number one, two, yeah, plus one, plus positive one. 12 or okay, positive yeah. 27 and does that. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, she does that and something. presents it and um, but she doesn't say whether them as the staff say the, it's, it it's the compatibility be. rating norm. yeah okay so yeah, it's, yeah we don't it's like have that it's numerically compatibility rating. Rating. that's the code yep. yeah yep and it, wor it works very well it, it gives you a, kind of a starting point to play with but then in the end you have to listen to the applicant and you got to look at all the facts that are coming yeah. before you interesting mm -hmm. Everything just one little bit different order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, and as I said, I I don't have any heartburn with anything that I've heard. I'm I'm okay with staff making recommendations, and I'm uh, you know I'd have a hard time seeing staff not making recommendations on certain applications, but um, because you know the city and the county will have have an interest in development and growth and an interest in um, the the code uh, being complied with. Nevertheless, I mean, the order in which people are heard, uh, whether it's the city or the or the or the staff goes first or the applicant, uh, from my perspective, um, it I'm OK either way, um, as long as everyone's afforded a chance. So um, are there any questions about open meetings, public hearings or um, well or, or public hearings? We're, we'll move on to decisions on the record here. OK, so. Um, and again, in the interest of, of moving quickly, I've, I've as usual over prepared, but um, your decision. So first of all, um, all all meetings must be recorded um, and or and or you can have a court a, a certified court reporter there. The cost of that is often prohibitive. It's essential. Uh, to to uh, to these sorts of hearings, um, and and that's because uh, you know there needs to be a record that can be reviewed by by a court. Um, so in that light, if an individual is going to present evidence, they should they should identify themselves uh, and uh, and cl and clearly uh, state uh, their interests uh, in a way that that can be transcribed and and reviewed on appeal if that's where we're going. Um, let's see here. Um, the the record so and finally um, the the commission should always take notice of all records um, that are of all record of all physical documents that are presented and submitted and so you know you can say just as simply as you know we've we've received this notice and we've see, we've received these documents from these individuals um, and you know we're taking notice of those uh, that were presented to us in the packet. Um, and so you can do that by reference. And so it's just it's just creating that record of the due process that can form the basis of your decision. Um, why don't we move on to slide number six? Bill, I got one quick question on the record. Uh, materials. Yeah, sure. 
once in a great while, uh, if an applicant's here in the meeting room, they'll occasionally bring some pictures that they took of the property, whether it's an applicant or somebody else that's against it, one or the other, and, and pass it around to the commissioners. Is that something we can accept? Because um, it's technically not online that anybody that's online, especially we're doing the Zoom type meetings. Is it something we can accept or we can say, sorry, we can't look at that? Uh, no, absolutely you can, just so long as it's made available um, to all of the commissioners um, and to any interested party in, of the public. And so, um, you know, some some commissions that I've represented in the past have said, well, if you're going to present new documentary evidence uh, prior to the meet or after the start of the meeting. Uh, hmm. Opportunity to 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 distribute that to the community and then and then and then allow a chance for rebuttal on that. Um, I think that that's kind of cumbersome, um, but on certain high conflict things, you might want to be that picky about the procedure. Um, so uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. And look, you're taking I, I take the perspective of look, you're taking you're taking evidence, and so if somebody wants to show up and present evidence at the time and date of the hearing, um, then you know if somebody else, if somebody has an interest, they need to be there to defend it, and and they can review those documents, um, and uh, uh, you know review those documents and respond. And look, if it's a really complicated thing, uh, then yeah, it might be something where you'd want to continue the hearing uh, till a later date to allow those in opposition or other interested parties an opportunity to re review and respond. And that's all part of that due process. So I think Commissioner Lyons, you're really thinking about the right things. And hopefully myself or, or staff is going to be online and, and be able to provide you advice in that instance where it might be a good idea to give um, interested parties an opportunity to, to respond to that at a later time. Um, so um, I'm going to go just real quick through this uh, so Diane can get to her stuff. I feel like I'm monopolizing the time here, um, but uh, findings of fact and conclusions of law. So um, it, the, the Local Land Use Planning Act requires that all decisions be supported with a reasoned statement that explains the basis of the decision in a meaningful way and documents that the decision was based on appropriate standards and criteria. Um, this applies to both approval and denial of applications and uh, it also uh, the local land use planning act and this is something that I had to be reminded of when I was preparing for this but it requires the decision maker to explain to an applicant how the applicant could how the application could be changed in the event of a denial to make it acceptable um, and that's in Idaho code 6764 Have to have a meaningful record of the findings of facts. So, what facts are formed the basis of your decision, and what law did you apply? Um, and then, and then you have to have an analysis of that of of that application, and then draw a conclusion about whether the application is going to be approved or not. Um, conditions and decisions. So, this is a really complicated area of the law, but um, typically um, these are called exactions. And what that means is often in exchange for granting permission to do to do something with their with with land, uh, the city or county will require um, some uh, additional uh, effort or, or improvement by the developer. Think improvement of intersections outside of subdivisions, think extension of uh, existing utilities, that sort of thing. Um, the there is a limit to what we can exact to what we can ask for and those are those are identified in two uh cases the nolan and dolan cases and in summary those cases stand for one there must be a nexus between the exaction or the condition of approval and the need created by the development so for example if if i was going to put in a subdivision three miles from the lake and you wanted me to put in a boat dock at the city um You'd have, I think you'd have a hard time creating that nexus um, without more. And then the second is the exaction must be roughly proportionate to the burden on public infrastructure imposed by the development. So, for example, if I'm going to build a subdivision, 
you know, you could probably ask me to improve the intersection in some portion of the existing right of way. Um, but, you know, asking me to do miles and miles and miles uh, of the right of way um, is probably not proportionate to the impact that my subdivision is going to have on traffic, for example. Um, so, so we just need to keep that in mind. Again, look for that nexus between what's being asked for and then uh, and proportionality. Does it make sense? Um, it, the development will have. So it looks like we've been on for like an hour and we've got through six, six slides. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, I think everybody should be provided a packet with this. So if we can go to slide seven. Uh, these are Diane's 10 Commandments. I really like this. Uh, she's a wonderful resource. Um, this is just a summary of everything we've talked about here. This is terrific. It's a good thing for you to keep in your back pocket and keep in mind. Uh, before I turn it over to Diane, any questions? Oh, looks like you're up, Diane. Great. Well, Bill, thank you very much. I think if um, commissioners, if you don't take anything away from today's presentation, uh, please take it, take Bill's comments to heart. And I know that um, he is available through staff. If you, anytime you have questions, that's really, you know, to take the initiative before the meeting, if you've got some issue and, and vet it out beforehand, it really saves a lot of grief later. So I encourage you to do that. And I'm sure Brian um, and staff will make um, Bill available when, when he's needed for those kinds of issues. So uh, there's, there's a little bit of duplication and overlap here in this next section with some of the, the comments Bill's already made, but I just have some principles for successful meetings and decisions. And a lot of this is just based on my experience and observation of, of commissions and how they operate and what good, what good principles really make for um, a good meeting and a good decision. So first of all, preparation. Um, you really, as a commissioner, need to have the time to prepare for the meeting. Um, you, you really can't expect to be a successful commission and commissioner if you have not taken the time to read the materials that are provided to you. So I really highlighted that. Please review and read and review all the materials and as you do, um, you know, if there's some questions that come to mind, jot them down or take some other notes. If you've got a non-substantive question for staff, you know, contact them ahead of time. They're there to help you. Now, I know time is, is really a tough one for all of the communities that have these, these building phases that bring in a lot of applications at the same time. And I know staff is pedaling as fast as they can sometime to meet all of their um, their deadlines. So, um, you know, if, if things get tough at, at some point and you don't feel you can make good decisions because of the workload, it's time member to have a little bit of a hiatus or have a pal off the staff and see what can be done um, to, to soften that blow a little bit. Because you're not gonna make good decisions if you've got um, really long agendas and you're working late at night. Um, after about two and a half, three hours, um, you know, your ability to think through some of these issues is really going to decline. So, um, you know, I think it's a good, good um, rule to just keep, keep in touch with staff. And, and if you've got issues with timing, don't, don't be afraid to, to raise your hand and say, look, um, I think we need to talk about this a little bit and see what can be done. Um, the second is staff support. And you are so fortunate to have the, the good staff, both at the city and the county that you do. There's a lot of rural and small communities uh, throughout the state that their staff is a part-time clerk, part-time treasurer, probably someone that really doesn't have any background in planning um, to, to support the commission, but you don't, you've got excellent staff here. And so you should uh, rely on them. They're there to, to support you and, to, um, to be your team member in, in making these good decisions. So what you should expect from them is um, timeliness. Um, and certainly Bill's got a little bit already um, that they provide you with detailed, accurate and objective analysis that their um, staff reports are presented in a way that um, you can uh, quickly read them and understand them. And I think um, staff reports are kind of a continuous improvement project. and 
you should always be looking, both staff as commissioners, of how to make them better. Just because they've been done in a certain firm, format for all, you know, for years, doesn't mean mean they can't be improved. And you know, every one of you probably reads material differently, and so the staff has a challenge in providing information that meets all of the different uh, ways people read through materials. And so I always suggest that the staff report um, contains a summary uh, of some sort and then is formatted in a way that you can get the highlights uh, very quickly through bullets or, or uh, bold or whatever. Um, presentation really can make a big difference in the readability of staff reports. So. Um, that's just some suggestions, I think, uh, you know, kind of always thinking about how those can be improved is, is not a negative thing, it's a good thing to, to do. Um, so Bill's talked about a little bit about this already. Um, the agenda, um, you know, it's important that it be uh, followed, that it's available to those who are going to participate and, and be effective participants in the process, and that you follow it. Now, I know from time to time there's a need to change the agenda. You you can't add anything or amend it um, after 24 hours before the meeting, but um, anytime you start moving things around, it really um, confuses everyone. So try to keep to the agenda that's sent out with the packet. And I know um, different communities handle agenda, the, the, um, the order of things in the agenda in different ways. And so many communities will stick right with, you know, the, the numbering system of the application. So whoever's in first is first on the agenda, second is, you know, third and so forth. Some communities, however, are a little more discriminating about thinking ahead of what is going to be a big issue and a big um, item that will attract a lot of community people and putting that up front so that um, a lot, a, a, a big group of public doesn't have to sit through a lot of small little items. But that's up to um, the, the chair and the staff how you want your agendas to flow. Minutes, um, you know, one of my big um, problems with minutes is spending a lot of time on them. They appear usually first at the start of the, uh, at the meeting. And my recommendations is that don't spend time during the meeting on small edits, non-substantive kinds of issues. Um, if you can send those to the staff beforehand and, and cover them um, that way, that would be better and they can make note of it. Any substantive issues, of course, you need to bring up um, if there was a, a, a error in the voting or some other um, information that's not accurate to what you feel was the basis for the decision, you certainly need to bring that up and, and make the, um, those changes. But try to keep your um, deliberation on the minutes as short as possible. The role of the chair is absolutely the most critical of all the commission. Um, you're all equal partners, you're all important, but the, the chair can make or break a, a, a a commission and the whole flow of the of, of the meeting. So um, they they're the person that really um, sets the tone. They have the most interaction with the public. Um, they they are the ones that need to maintain control of the agenda of the process as it goes. And um, I I think at the same time um, I've seen commissions where the the chair is the commission and there's a lot of commissioners that sit back and let the, uh, let the chair, uh, you know, take over and make, uh, do, you know, make all of the, the process and the decisions. They should, they really should be a moderator and just lead and step in when, and when the rest of the commissioners get stuck. Um, so don't, don't, don't rely too much on the chair to make all the decisions. And at the same time, they should be providing you uh, with good direction and keep going back. I forgot to bring did he make a face? <laughs> <laughs> Rob's being funny. Yeah. Um, and, and then and then finally, the chair really needs to be the expert. All of you need to know basic Robert's rules of orders, but but the chair is going to be faced sometimes with some issues. And so they really need to be able to, um, you know, be able to recall what those procedures are very quickly. And we've got some material here Bill's going to go over that'll give you all some guidance on that. Um, Bill, um, 
cover the public hearing. Um, you know, you've got to have uh, information ahead of time. Um, and during these COVID uh, periods where you don't have a, a paper that everybody can read that comes into the hearing meeting, um, maybe the chair at the beginning of the hearing needs to just go over the general rules for the public so that they understand you sometimes get people who have never been to a meeting and so they're they're really sort of lost in what the proceedings are. So having some rules available that everybody understands and then mostly important, keep keep to those rules, make sure that everybody abides by them. And, and Bill emphasized the formality of the meetings in terms of you are sitting there as judges, but you can do that in a comfortable manner um, and still maintain your demeanor. Um, so that's the kind of, I think, the atmosphere you should um, you should have a goal to, to try to keep. And then as much as possible, speak through the chair. This really does help for the chair to maintain the order of the meeting and, and um, um, make sure that people are heard and only one person is heard at a time. Um, ask questions. Um, a lot of times there's information that is useful to you, um, especially when you hear a lot of opinions and trying to um, correlate those opinions with the code sometime and what the standards are for your review can be a real challenge. And so by asking questions that helps you to better understand um, and also the public to better understand um, that the decision has to be made based on the code requirements and not um, just um, more opi personal opinions that aren't related at all. Um, and then finally, um, I think for the, for the benefit of the, the record keeping, you really need to avoid questioning the staff during the public testimony. And I, I think this is sometimes difficult because a member of the public will have a very uh, relevant question that they need answered during their testimony. But to start to do a triangular question of staff, public, commission, really can get out of control very quickly. And it makes it hard, as I mentioned, for the recorder to really um, record the, the progress of that discussion. So um, if that comes up, I you know, usually say to the, to the member of the public, it's a great question. And when we finish the public hearing, we'll be able to have the staff answer that question or the applicant or whoever is most appropriate. So any questions or comments on any of these guidelines that um, anyone has? Diane, uh, Sasha on the chat asked uh, if you could explain a little more thoroughly what you mean by speak through the chair. Yes, I think that, um, you know, both, um, let's say, for example, you have a public member that's speaking and uh, a commissioner wants to ask them a question. The appropriate thing is for them to say, uh -huh. Chairman Lyons, may I ask this member of the public a question. Um, and same with um, if you as a staff are going to answer a question of the commissioner, ask the chairman if you can answer or the commissioner's question. Does that make sense? Who's that, Brian? I was asking on behalf of Sasha online. She says yes, that makes sense. OK. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? So um, we talked a little bit about this already, and, and I put that arrow there because I know McCall is fairly unique from my experience in having applicant testimony come before staff. But I, this, this graphic is really here to, um, to kind of create a context of your public hearing, which it really consists of two phases. One is that fact finding where you're hearing from the staff, the applicant, and you're hearing public comments, you're asking questions, you're really digging into all of the detailed facts and information that you need to make a decision. And then that should really be over. And I know sometimes it can't be because things will come up during your discussion. But as, as, as much as you possibly can to close the public hearing and then move into the second phase which is really your show. It's really the commissioner's opportunity to deliberate. And the discussion for the most part should be among you and not the rest of the public and the staff and the applicant. 
Um, and sometimes you'll need to open it up um, to get some more information. If you do so from the applicant, then you also should make opportunity for any other member of the public to comment on that same issue if, if it's a new topic and it's a new issue that just came up. But um, for the most part, this second phase is really for your time to discuss, to vet through all the issues and to come to a motion and decision. Any comments or questions about that? Okay, um, I'm just going to do a few little more details here about, and Bill's already talked about what you should expect from staff. It should be basic facts about the application or the proposal, um, and then the relevant code provisions. Um, any other information that they gathered from other interested agencies, uh, letters uh, from the public, um, they should document what those are. And then I'm, I'm of the school that staff is there to provide you with recommendations. Um, so there should be at least optional recommendations or proposed motions for you to consider. Um, and then any other additional information um, that uh, you feel is unanswered, that the staff feels is unanswered or is there's contrary or conflicting uh, facts about um, they can highlight those for you to, to question more through the public hearing and from the applicant and from the public. Um, and then the applicant, um, you know, they usually are provided for uh, uh, 10 minutes or more uh, to present, but there should be some, um, there should be some limitations on the uh, applicant's testimony. And they should, that should be in your rules or the handouts about the public meeting. Um, the, the applicants, especially architects, tend to tell you every little detail about the floor plan and all the internal arrangements of a house when really all you care about is the external look of it. So, you know, you may from time to time need to, re, to re focus their discussion on the relevant uh, parts of the application or the design as it relates to the criteria and the code. You should always ask any questions that you have, anything to clarify, and don't be intimidated. You'll get a lot of um, uh, high-powered attorneys like Bill before you, and uh, don't be intimidated by or by experts. Um, you know, if you get some technical experts on particular issues, um, it's their responsibility to communi communicate the information in a way that you and a any other layperson can understand. So, you know, if they get into a lot of, um, you know, details that uh, aren't relevant or you don't understand, be sure to ask them. The, you know, if this is important information to base the decision on, you've got to be sure that you understand it. Um, and then, like like we mentioned before, don't get give provide deference to those that you know. And I know as working as a staff in a community, you um, will tend to see certain applicants, certain developers or architects that do you know do good jobs and you, you know they're, they're going to follow through. And then you may get some others that you don't know as well. Um, and it's easy to think, okay, well, we know uh, Mr. Brown and he's great and we don't really have to worry about those things, but you really don't get into that slippery slope because everybody needs to be treated um, fairly and equitably as, as Bill's mentioned. Public comments, be sure to have a sign-up sheet when you're in virtual, in a, in a non-virtual environment. Um, make sure that the person is recognized by the chair and that they speak from the podium. Um, I know sometimes the public doesn't understand that they need to be in front of a microphone because the, the process has to be recorded, but it's important that they, um, they do that and that they also identify who's speaking so you have a clear and correct record of that. And then stick to the time limits, as Bill mentioned, as, as much as you can. Um, sometimes uh, jurisdictions will ask that the testimony be organized in three phases of those who support, those who are in opposition, 
and those who are neutral. I think that really is helpful to both you and everyone else to kind of see the, the organization, to organize these things in your mind. And also um, it, it helps to reduce redundancy too. If you get a long line of people in opposition that are saying the same thing, it's, it's easier to kind of encourage <coughs> If to, to only speak to new facts or information. And then highlighting, and I think Bill's underscored this already, is that you need to encourage them to provide testimony that's fact-based and to provide real reasons for their position related to the application of the code to the, to the project um, and really discourage them from it, it, extraneous um, information that's not really the, the basis under which you make your decision. Um, discourage duplication, as I mentioned. And if you do have spokespersons representing a certain group of people, um, it's, usually, um, it's usually giving them a little more extra time and because that does um, help to save you time if you're not listening to a lot of individuals and you have a representative instead. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that one piece on that, I uh, like what you put down there, encourage fact-based testimony. Um, and we see that all the time, people getting up, and I got to be better as a chair on that, that sometimes people get up there and they just have a personal opinion. And encouraging them to keep it fact-based is something I got to be better about, you know, for their position. Because um, everybody's got a personal opinion, but you got to yeah. keep it fact based. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for that comment. And I think, you know, the, the other commissioners have a responsibility too. And, and they can be very um, polite about it by saying, I appreciate your opinion about <clears throat> such and such, but I can't make my decision based on that opinion. I, I am a commissioner that um, makes decisions based on the code. That's why I'm here. And so I think you can explain that to people. It's not always accepted, you know, very favorably, but um, they've got to know that, you know, their opinions aren't gonna be the basis for your decision. Yeah. Any other comments or questions at this point? Look at the time here. So um, again, for the commission discussion, that second phase of the public hearing, you can prepare for that, you know, the minute you get your packet, reading all the information and then really being an active listener um, and taking notes and asking meaningful questions. And I think it's important that during this virtual time that you keep your cameras on if you're, you have cameras so that people can actually see you. I, I think that really um, communicates that you're actively listening. People want to know that they're, they're being heard. So I think that's important from a public standpoint. Um, and then during the commission discussion, and I know this is hard. I know when you become a, a commissioner for the first time, it's like jumping into a cold um, pool of water. And uh, all of you that are new commissioners, I would say, um, you know, you're just gonna have to do it. If you've, if you've got comments, prepare in advance, take some notes for a while until you get really good at it and you can talk off the top of your head. But not everybody um, joins the commission with that ability. So don't get frustrated if you feel you're not um, uh, as, as participatory as you want to be. It'll come with time. But I encourage all of you to participate. You all should have um, some conclusions that you've made during that discussion, and you should express those. Don't rely on one or two people to carry the load for the commission. It's really um, a responsibility for every member to um, participate and to express their opinion. Um, so don't try to negotiate, um, keep an open mind, um, and it's okay if you disagree with your um, fellow commissioners. Uh, everybody's gonna have a different interpretation of the facts and um, or what the, what's important about the application or the conditions. Um, so it's okay if there's not unanimous decisions on everything, um, you know, you're gonna move forward and see another application uh, soon again and have an opportunity to, um, to vote differently. So 
Um, I, it's a kind of a creative process in a way, this discussion period, but um, you know, there's the other thing I would suggest to any of you that have time is most communities now, uh, you know, uh, keep some, some communities keep a record of their hearing. They'll have a video of their hearing that um, it's interesting sometimes to just pick one up and, and I can give you a list of who I think has some good commissions and to observe commissions, you learn a lot about um, the, the way to do it correctly and sometimes the way to do it not correctly. But um, you know, sometimes modeling your role with some other uh, commission or even another commissioner on the, on, in your group that you really respect and you like um, their, um, their participation, kind of model yourself after them or watch them very deliberately to, to see how it's done well. Um, okay, any any comments or questions? I know we've got to move ahead. Just a couple more slides here on Robert's rules that we wanted to get to. I think, Bill, if you could, um, we had a, we had a section on the Local Land Use Planning Act, but I think maybe we can skip that and and talk about Robert's rules. Does that sound like where you want to go, commissioners, staff? I've got just a quick question. Yes. Regarding the preparation for the meetings, if we have a question for staff beforehand, is it appropriate to copy the other commissioners so we're all on the same page going into the meeting as far as just clarifying something about the application with staff or does it need to be just individual question to staff? Oh, no, I'd be, not appropriate. OK. I'd be a little bit careful about that. I mean, I think oh, yeah. you could, I, My God, a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> you to work that time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think if there's something that's really not substantive, you have a question, you certainly can contact staff. And then if the discussion happens to fall into something that's more of substance, then, you know, you, I think, just disclose that at the meeting, say, I just we were talking about this and this is what the staff so because if it's good enough for you it really should be shared i think your initial thought was right um that you know if it's a, if it's information that's important to you it's probably important to the other commissioner members as well diane i'd like to chime in on that just a little bit um the reason i i came on and shook my head uh, was not about the asking staff part it was about the copying other commissioners part sure um, You've got to be uh, really careful uh, not to communicate and create a quorum outside of an, uh, a, a noticed public meeting. And so one of the one of the real traps that a lot of my municipal clients run into is uh, email chains and reply alls. And um, the definition of a deliberation under Idaho code is very, very broad. And so if you engage in any sort of discussion on a matter that is before or likely will come before your commission outside of an open meeting when you violated the open meeting law. And so that's that's why I popped on and shook my head. I, I don't really don't mind if you reach out to staff in particular if you if you disclose that ex parte communication. Um, but if you do that in a way that you include all other commissioners, I think um, you're creating problems that you maybe didn't intend. And sure. so if have those conversations at an open meeting. Sounds good. Thank you. Great question. Thank you so much. Any other? So are we agreed to just go ahead with Robert's rules and, and skip uh, the local plan use planning act at this point? OK. Hearing none, we'll move ahead then. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> That's that's actually a really funny segue, Diane. I, I caught your joke. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we'll go quickly on this because we promised an hour and a half and and I'd like to stick to that. Um, just the basics of how to conduct a meeting, how to how to engage in that deliberation. And uh, we can do that in an organized fashion where everyone still gets to express themselves, where everyone gets to uh, present their opinions. And ultimately, as a board, you make a decision. And one thing to keep in mind is that uh, as a single commissioner, you really don't have any authority or power. You only have authority as a group. And so the question then becomes, well, as a group, how do we wield our authority? And the answer is through parliamentary procedure and Robert's rules. Um, and so 
Uh, typically, we, we, as you all know, uh, we engage in a process of making motions and that's and then we vote on those motions. And so uh, we'll be a little more granular about that here in a few minutes. Um, but uh, the general guidelines, um, the first one bullet point is staff prepared motions. I am uh, I generally like uh, staff prepared motions um, on issues that we know are going to be very complex and um, but with one caveat the and that caveat is um, I think it's important that if staff is going to provide motions to the commission that they provide motions that go um, either way that the question could be called and so it could you could the staff should provide a motion in favor and a motion against or a motion denying and a motion approving um, and uh, so I guess that's my only thought on those staff prepared motions. Otherwise, I like them because you know allows you to have some some clarity. Um, again, understanding that you know even staff and and even myself sometimes we can't anticipate all eventualities, but it does it does allow for some clarity. Um, the parliamentary procedures, uh, McCall City Code three fifteen oh four requires the use of Roberts Rules of Order. Um, I am not going to strictly adhere to that as the attorney for the commission or the city council, um, but you know what I will adhere to is motion practice uh, and voting. And so, um, you know, I think that you can really get bogged down in the vagaries of Robert's rules of order. Um, but you know, the bottom line is, if we want to to do something as a commission, we make a motion, and then we can debate that motion, and then we vote on the motion. We either vote it up or we vote it down. Um, speak clearly and concisely. I think that, uh, you know, that's easier said than done. Um, and as well as staying on the subject, you're talking to the king of digression. But I think that, um, you know, it is important that that we make a record of what the motion is. And if and sometimes that takes a little bit of wordsmithing and as a group that can be cumbersome, um, but that's what that's what, uh, you know, often staff will help. With that, um, I've helped make motions uh, before, and and as a group, you can you can make what's called friendly amendments to the motion to make it make more sense and make it more clear on what you want to vote on. We'll get on onto that in just a minute. Um, the state motion affirmatively. Um, it's kind of like the magic words, right? So um, instead of saying I think we should or let's or things like that. If we if we want the board to take an, an action, um, we should utter the magic words. I move that we and then state your motion. Um, and then the final uh, good general guideline here is one motion at a time. Um, that doesn't mean that there can't be uh, amending motions and there can't be competing motions, um, but typically we, we like to resolve them in a manner that's that is organized. And often that will be that the first motion made is the first motion uh, to, to be finally resolved and uh, and brought to a resolution. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So um, making motions, the basic outline. Once again, it's the it's the magic words. Um, often it's move to approve, disapprove, or approve with conditions, and then we state those conditions. Um, the the motion then would be seconded and, and it's important that your motion have some support. Sometimes a motion will fail for lack of a second and then you know just exactly where you stand with with the rest of your commissioners on a given issue. Uh, and uh, if it is that your motion is seconded, uh, then then you allow discussion on that motion and that's where you know you debate uh, the the upside and the downside of whatever action it is that the board wants to take. And then once the once everyone's had an opportunity to speak their piece and I do is I do advise the chair to really not just give everyone one chance, but often give the commissioners an ability to deliberate and to respond to each other's comments. But at some point it becomes clear that it's time to call the question and when we call the question, it means that we're asking for a determinative vote. On on the motion that's on on the floor at that time. Uh, it's a good practice to reiterate the motion that's that's out there so that everybody is clear on exactly what is being uh, voted on and so that uh, staff that's creating the record can <coughs> maintain clear clear minutes of the of the motion. 
Uh, the vote on the motion. So typically the you can call the vote and it's a voice vote. Uh, sometimes you can make a roll call vote. In particular, if you're going into an executive session, a roll call vote is required. Um, uh, or if you want to make a record of how each commissioner votes, you can you can request that a roll call vote be made. Um, written ballots, I, I typically discourage. Um, I think that you know our minutes serve as a, a good record of of what is uh, what is being done by the board. If we could go to the next slide, please. So I, I mentioned that there's an ability to amend motions and and you know some of this seems really elementary to me, but I don't uh, you know I spend a lot of time in meetings and a lot of people don't. And so um, sure, sometimes when you make a motion um, and then you deliberate, it becomes clear that maybe we want to amend the motion. And there's what's called friendly emotion or, or friendly amendments, and this is when uh, the person who has made the motion uh, agrees with a change to the verbiage or language. Um, the the second way that you can do that is there can be a motion on the floor and and you can move to amend. My typical approach to this is rather than amend the motion on the floor is either vote vote as stated up or down and then make a new motion. But technically you can't amend a motion that's on the floor. Um, and then you can create a substitute motion. And again, my personal preference is vote up or down the motion that's on the floor and then and then um, you can at that point you can offer a, a competing motion and we can evaluate that on the merits of the of the motion made. Um, let's go to the next page, please. There are some other motions. Um, the chair can call the question uh, and only the chair can call the question under Robert's rules of order. Um, there move to a previous question, which is uh, if you have competing motions on the floor, I, I don't like to get into this. I like to just keep it clean, resolve a motion, and then if there's a competing motion, let's make that one. Um, but you know, there can be some procedural reasons why you'd want to have competing motions. Um, that's you guys playing politics on your board, which I really try to minimize. Um, and then uh, a motion to table. And and that's one that you probably do come along that does come along uh, frequently. And a motion to table uh, means that you're going to put put off whatever the issue is until a successive or until a later meeting. Um, and uh, at that point, um, you know, frequently where we have lots of evidence coming in where we're not prepared to make a decision where we want time to consider, um, you can table a motion, but that's going to require re notice. Um, what I typically like to do is continue, and I believe that's on the next slide. If we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, well, there, that's, I guess it's not on the next slide. Um, I like to continue under those circumstances so that you don't have to re-notice and reopen the public hearing. You just continu continue the public hearing to a later date. Um, and I go, oh, there it is, motion to continue number three or remand it back to the staff. Um, remanding back to staff um, from from my perspective, uh, typically would would kill the application. Um, and then a motion to reconsider is you've made a decision, but then new new considerations have come to light and you can revote. Um, I can't recall a time that I've seen a board reconsider something that they've already voted on. Typically, they've they, we, we try to have that be final. Um, I went through that very quickly. Are there procedural questions about how to get your business done according to Robert's rules of order? Hearing none, Diane, I think you're up. <laughs> well, I would just close with um, some resources um, that are available to you both locally and um, from national uh, organizations. And we'll make the slides available to you if you want to look at these in any more. Um, and is there any more questions or comments? Yes, your staff is your, your biggest resource. Um, if not, I will leave you with this uh, final comment that we can have world peace through zoning and planning. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Better <laughs> zoning and planning. I yeah, wish we'd known that a long time ago. Yeah, now you tell us. But you would be at the end, should it? Well, thank you all for your attention. I really appreciate um, the good work that you do in both all your communities in Valley County. Hope to see you all soon again.
All right, Diane, thank you very thank much. Bill, you. appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. See you at the next meeting. <laughs>